Hi everyone, my name's Andrew and I've been wood turning and sculpting in Australia for approximately 10 years. The inspiration for my pieces come from everywhere, from architecture to nature to just generally everywhere. I really like to create different forms and textures and combine the two to create different artworks. Creating different textures is probably my favourite part of the process. Some days I just have experimental days where I spend all day just designing and creating different textures. In this demonstration today, I'm going to show you how I make a couple of different pieces. This first piece I'm going to show you came about by just playing around with different existing pieces in my studio. Just by laying different pieces on top of each other to see what things looked like. It uses a few different techniques, first by using the lathe to turn the form, then doing some texturing off the lathe. Anyway, we'll get into it and if you have any questions just let me know at the end of the video. Today we're going to use this piece of jacaranda that I've had in the shed for a little while. It's probably about two inches thick, uh, it's been drying for a few years now. The piece we're going to make is a circle, so I'm uh, just going to create uh, a circle and then cut that out on the bandsaw. So I'm just going to measure out approximately 15 centimeters. It's about there. Make sure that's centered roughly. Then use this ruler that just has holes drilled in it just to create a circle that I can trace on the bandsaw. It's going to make a bit of a heavier mark in that center there for the uh, lathe. Now that I've done that, I'm going to take it to the bandsaw to cut it out. Now I'm just going to check the piece for imperfections and it all looks pretty good. Just going to put it on the chuck. And now I'm going to open the jaws a little bit wider. So I'm going to just press the wood against the chuck. I'm going to hold it in the chuck at this point. That should be enough. Just bring up my tail stock. Find that center point I made before on the workbench. Hold it against the chuck. Lock in my tail stock and press it against the chuck. It should hold it nice and firm. The idea is just going to create a tenon on this side, then turn it around and then true it up that way. Now that this is all locked into place, it's going to trip up this side to create the tenon. The width of the tenon, I want it to be as big as the chuck can hold because later on I want to drill a hole through it from the other side and then the drill bit will protrude into the chuck a little bit. I also want to keep this flat as I can, and it's not very flat at the moment, it's a little bit dished towards the middle. So it's going to try and true this up. It's just this outside section that needs a little bit of work. 
It doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, now that's looking pretty flat, I'm just going to create the tenon. Now it's going to do a bit of sanding on this side to uh, save myself time later on and that'll make it completely flat and smooth. Ready for the next step. So the next step is to remove the towel stop and turn the piece around and lock it in the jaws. It's going to bring the tail stock up this time because this piece is still a bit unbalanced. unbalanced. I don't do this all the time, but for this piece I will, just for a little bit of security there. So I'm just going to trip up this side for the moment and get it all balanced. So. needs to take a little bit more off there so I'll start it again might be able to increase the revs a little bit more just a touch That looks pretty good and it is fairly flat, which we'll do for the moment. We're actually going to make this piece angle inwards towards the centre. So I just clean up this piece here and we'll get ready to drill a hole through the middle. Before I drill the hole through the middle, I'm going to trim up this outside edge and what I'm going to do is actually make it slightly concave so that when it stands up by itself, it'll have those two outside edges to rest on. Some more. That's getting very, very close. That's looking pretty good. Another way to check it is to use a level. When I use the level, I'll check this side and I can see it's not quite right. It needs to take a little bit more off the left side. And I always check the other side as well. And sometimes from this angle on the other side of the lathe, you can see that it's not quite right easier than you can on the other side for some reason. That could it be just me though.
pretty bang on. It's going to do a bit of a finishing cut. A bit more speed now it's nice and true. Jacarina tends to have a little bit of tear out. You can see a little bit there, but it's not too bad. We are going to make this concave as well, so it's not a huge issue. And of course, we're going to texture it all, so you really probably won't notice. It's not, you don't really need to do any sanding, but I, I might do a little bit on it. So this is going to create this concave part now, so that the piece can stand on its two sides and not wobble around when it's standing on someone's table, shelf. And you have to be very slightly concave. We go almost to the edge. So we leave those two edge pieces that are, we don't touch the two very edge pieces. They stay the same, we just carve out the middle. Just take your time on this one. You can use sandpaper to create this concave part as well. And clean up the very edges a little bit. And leave, largely leave them untouched. That's getting very close. I don't know if you can see, or you probably can't, but it's just resting on this edge and this edge over here, so that should do nicely. I'm just going to move my tar stock out of the way and take off this little piece here so that's nice and flat, ready to drill. Now that I've done that, I'm going to bring my towel stock back in and just mark the center. I'm just going to use a force and a bit to drill a hole all the way through the piece. Of course, we did a wide tenon on the back. This will go all the way through without hitting the jaws of the chuck. Just a nice, slow, steady speed. We're going to create an angle towards the center, so it'll be angled, it'll be deeper in the in the center section. Um, how deep you do this is up to you, but I like to leave about 10 to 20 mils at the back, because you have to allow a room for the uh, tenon to take the tenon off later on. So that's about five to 10 millimeters thick. 
as well. This is quite a thick piece of wood, so it might uh, be a little bit thicker than that this time. There's no real rules in art, so do whatever you think looks best. Generally, I'll try and keep this as straight as possible as I go. It doesn't have to be perfect though. I've got a long way to go. The moment's got a bit of a curve in it, so I need to go deeper in that centre section. From about here. That's getting close to the depth I want. Not quite there though. As you've noticed, I've been working from the inside out. Working my way back further and further, going in. Just checking to see how flat this is, and it's not too bad. That will probably do. Might just go over it one more time for a nice, uh, with a nice finishing cut. This piece actually requires a step, so I'll have one texture in the center to approximately here, and from there it'll be a step down up to a different texture here and on the outside. So I'll just roughly mark that. So off camera I've just adjusted this line and the first line was probably a little bit too far out so I've actually created a second line so we're just going to cut another angle slightly deeper than the first angle to create a bit of a step up to the second angle. You'll see what happens when I, I do that, you'll see how that works. So that's pretty much that, although I need to sort of cut this again a little bit shallower. So I just use my spindle gouge to, and fiddle around with that to get that nice, a nice curve happening.
that's pretty much it. I just need to do some sanding, clean it all up, and um, it's good for texturing. So I'm just using my sander to create a nice round radius there. This part I only usually sand to 120 grit because we come back to that later. For this I'll take this up to 240 grit to get it nice and smooth ready for the texture which is the next step. That's a nice transition there so that's good for texturing there. We're going to do the same texture there as we do on there. And then we're going to paint these two sections before we move on to this section. Just be careful of this corner here as it can get quite sharp. You can take a little bit off that edge just in case. There we go. So for the texturing, for the first texture, I'm going to use this carbide bit uh, in a die grinder. These little carbide bits come in all different shapes and sizes and you can get them from any sort of hardware store. When you first get started, it's always a good idea, uh, if you're not too familiar with the bit or the grinder, is to just have a bit of a play for 20, 10, 20 minutes on some scrap wood, work out how you can best hold the tool and how you can best texture using uh, an overlay technique where each texture or each part, each individual texture can overlay the other texture somewhat. So that's one outside edge done. Now I'll do the other outside edge and then just fill in the middle. Die grinding does get very heavy, so take lots of breaks and um, take your time and you'll get through it in no time. This whole piece would probably take, this whole edge would probably take me half an hour and then we're going to do the same texture around the front face edge. So I've started filling in the middle, that's probably a couple of minutes worth there. I generally work across that way and then back across, then across, and then across again. Don't try and make them all the same, just go with the flow, some may be big, some may be small. That's what gives it more of a handmade look. So there you go, all done. 
You do get a bit of fuzziness on some of them. The end grain's always quite clean, but you get a few fuzzy spots here. And there's a couple of ways you can try to get rid of that. The first way you can have a go at getting rid of these fuzzy bits is using a brush. So you can sort of just brush it or you can turn the lathe on and use it to try and get rid of those fuzzy bits. We'll see how that goes. Does anyone know what this is? Let me know if you do. I'll give you one guess. A variation of that is putting it in a drill. Next thing we're going to do is take it off the lathe. When you take it off the lathe, make sure you leave the chuck attached. So take the piece off with the chuck attached and then I usually put it in my workbench vise to do the next texturing on the front of the piece. In the end there, you probably saw me going over some of the same parts again. That's because it helps get rid, of all, get rid of some of those fuzzy bits.
So that is all of that texturing done. The next step is to paint these two sides, the top and the side. Just make sure you spend some time and get rid of all those fuzzy bits. That'll save you a lot of mucking around and it'll look a lot better uh, when it's fin finished being painted. So get your, your brush or you can use an eraser and just go round and round until you remove as much of those fuzzy bits as you can. Take some time doing that. Now I'll go in the other direction. If I let go of the piece it does this. We don't need that happening. You can also go from directly above. As I said, you can use an eraser to get rid of some of the fuzzy bits. Um, and by eraser, I mean those rubbers you use on your disc sander to clean them. That works well to get rid of some of the fuzzy bits as well. So now we are up to painting. I just use regular acrylic with a regular kind of brush, nothing fancy. You can use better paints, it does cover slightly better, but um, in general I'm going to have to do about three coats anyway. I usually just pop some on my brush and just work the paint around. What I do is I just keep working it around, just filling all the gaps, trying not to use too much and trying not to leave paint in the in the texture so as I'm going along I'm painting it and if a texture has paint in it I'm wiping it out again I've also got this white paper towel where I can wipe off excess as I go so I just keep going over and over the area and you can dab and wipe and do whatever you can to get it in the textures and when I feel like it's covered and it's starting to dry and there's no paint hiding in the corners of the texture I move along. The most important thing is to wipe the excess paint out but we're not painting this main section here we're leaving that for later. Now that we're finished painting we're going to clean up this face here with some 240 grit paper um, all the way up to 400 grit paper to give a nice smooth uh, surface.
Now I just want to clean up in here a little bit. I'm going to clean up a little bit later, but I'll still quick clean up and then I'm going to mask this off because what we're going to do is a white wash on this front section here. It's going to use some masking tape to mask in here so we don't get any paint inside of this middle section. If we do get it in here, you can sand it off, it just takes a little bit longer to do. To create a really quick whitewash, I'm just going to put a little bit of paint in a jar. And add a tiny bit of water. That's probably too much. Then mix it up. Probably needs a tiny bit more water in there. I don't seem to have enough paint, so I put a bit more paint in. We're just going to do a bit of a test on some timber, so we paint it on. Then I like to wait 10 seconds. That looks pretty good. I might have to do coats, or you can leave it on longer to have a stronger finish. Before I do the whitewash, I like to wipe over with a damp cloth. This raises the grain and then I'll sand it back again with some 240 grit paper or 400 grit paper to uh, make it smooth again. I feel that's raised the grain slightly so I'll knock that down again with my sandpaper. Just a little bit. Now I'm just going to paint on my whitewash. That's all covered. Now using a rag, I'll put some whitewash on the rag so it's slightly damp. And then just rub the whitewash in. Then I remove excess whitewash following the direction of the grain. I'm just going to clean up the inside of the middle here before I go any further, as much as I can. Using a thin cutoff disc, I'm going to create radial lines all the way around from the center out.
All done, now we're just going to put it back on the lathe and finish this centre section here. I'm going to make a V groove with the skew chisel on the line we created earlier, but the V groove has to be deeper than the texture, radial texture. We make it fairly deep. I think that's okay. We can make adjustments later. Then I want to, then I want to cut this way so that we have a little bit of a bevel going in towards the piece. I haven't quite gotten rid of some of those radial lines. So I'm going to have to go a little bit deeper in the V-groove and then do some more cutting on the centre part. And that is that. I'll take a photo of that so you can see a little bit closer. Now that's done, I'm going to get a little bit of 400 sandpaper and just sand in those grooves a little bit. Just using each corner of the sandpaper. Finally we can take it off the chuck, off the lathe and we'll work on removing this tenon. So all we have to do now is remove this tenon and clean up this back face and we're all done.
This second piece I'm going to show you came about just through experimentation with different forms. Using this carving technique you can create different layers within the form and each layer in this has a different texture. Once again if you have any questions just let me know after the video. So now I've got this piece of jacaranda that I'm going to cut to size then flatten. So now I'm going to attach my template to the timber, just using spray adhesive. I'm just going to make sure I keep this flat edge of the template along the flat edge of the timber. Alright, give that a minute to dry. Now to get ready for carving, I'm just going to mark around the circumference of the piece how far in I want to carve to on my initial carving. So I'm just going to use my finger to create a, line, a couple of lines. This is generally just a rough guide and I might even create a line within that line as well. So we just keep working our way around. I've now got my piece on the workbench on top of some non-slip rubber matting which you can get from any sort of hardware store. nice and secure. Then I'm going to use my Sabur disc to make the initial carving. I'm going to carve at a 45 degree angle to start with and then slowly start to taper the angle up towards the center of the piece. I'm going to do this all the way around. When I get to the base I'm not going to taper down as far this side because I want that base to remain fixed so it has good stability when it's standing up on a shelf.
So that's the basic idea. I'm just going to clean this up a little bit and then I'm going to turn it over and do the other side. I will curve this. I will bring in these edges a little bit further in so it's more of a, a curve that way. But that's basically the idea. I'll do the other side and then we'll go to the next step. Now I've got the piece in my vise and I'm just going to refine these edges and how it sort of curves around this way. To do this part I've actually changed to a flappy disc that'll just be a little bit more delicate than the carbide burrs. So now that I've got my flap disc on, I'm going to refine this and smooth it out as much as I can. Take your time with this part because the smoother you get it now, the less hand sanding you've got to do in the future. Now that we've done our sanding with a flappy disc, uh, it's basically all hand sanding until we get it all nice and perfect. Um, I usually use a block or a sanding mouse and we just hand sand it till it's perfect. So I'm just marking with some pencil lines a rough guide on how to carve this piece. Once again, I'm going to carve it with the Sabur uh, disc, but as I go along, it will change. Now that I've drawn up these lines as a guide, I'm going to use a carbide disc to do the carving.
All right, that went well. Just gonna work my way from 120 grit all the way up to 240 grit. It shouldn't take too long. After we do that, we can do our textures. All right, that's 120 grit done. I'll move on to 180, then 240, and then I'll see you after that for texturing. Now I'm after the texturing, I am going to do some circle sort of shaped bits there, and some circle shaped bits there, and some lines there, and something else there. For the circle shaped texture, I'm going to use this carbide bits.
So next I'm going to do some stripes. So I'm just going to draw some guidelines. And for the stripes, I'm going to use a small carbide ball. If 
finally we're going to use this carbide bit to do the texture in this last section here. So that's the texturing done. Uh, from here you can leave it the way it is, or you can stain it, or you can paint it. This time I'm going to paint it just like the last piece. All ready for painting, so I've just got some general white acrylic paint. Paintbrush, and let's get to work. Oh, I also have a paper towel to wipe off excess paint, if I need to. This will require probably three coats. Everywhere. You can get it over the lines, um, it just means more sanding afterwards, the messier you are. You can sort of let it sit in there and you can wipe it out after it sort of dries a little bit. You can dob and swirls, dobs and swirls work well, get it all in there. Generally, the more paint, the better, as you can always wipe off. Oh, no, that's way too much. Uh, you can always wipe, wipe off what you don't need. But I'm running out of white paint, so I must be frugal. So other ways you can finish this with is, is with a stain. Sometimes I like to use brown Japan or black Japan. Uh, they're two colours we have here in Australia by Feast Watson. Um, there are spirits, spirit based stains, so they soak into, into the wood really well. And it's really hard to, to bugger it up. The bad thing about it is you must have a really, really good finish, otherwise, it'll show up any little marks. So you can keep going over areas and you can sort of dab your brush off and sort of just a little bit there and um, just sort of get the, the paint out excess paint out 
of the texture. You don't want to fill up the texture full of paint. So they're starting to dry. And I wiped out LVX's paint, so we'll start on the next section. There you go, one coat done. Best enjoyed while having a beer. Two more coats to go and then we'll be ready to final sand it. Now that we've got our three coats on, uh, we can finish it up. We just need to sand off the extra paint on the front face there. Uh, the, the easiest way to do that is to use a sanding block. That way you can keep that sharp edge. So we just sand along and remove all the extra paint. If we did this by hand, without the block, we could go over this edge and round it off. We want to keep it nice and sharp. So that's it, I'm just going to go over and sand it up to 400 grit, uh, give it a coat of artist spray and then that's about it.